Aloha y'all, Daniel Aaron here, your guide to Vibrant Living, and here is the second spiritual leadership axiom. Experiential learning is true learning. By the way, do you know the word axiom? No, I don't mean that to sound insulting. I just, I said that to a friend not long ago, and they're like, axiom, what does that mean? And I don't assume anybody knows anything. I try and speak plainly as much as possible when I wrote my book, The Art of Spiritual Leadership, 40 Laws to Transform Your Life and the World. I put laws because I wasn't sure everybody knew the word axiom. What it means though, what the law means, what this is, experiential learning is true learning, is that's the way it is. That's like a law of the universe. And to make that more clear though here's a little story one of my favorites that comes to us from hinduism from the old days in india uh, spoken about this story and you know maybe actual thing myth uh, reality who knows there's a great west african saying which is all stories are true so this story we hear about in the mahabharata and the ramayana two of the greatest spiritual texts in the world and from India. And the story is of a dude, technical term, by the name of Ashtavakra. Yogis, you may know his pose, the pose that was named after him, Ashtavakrasana, right? Which is a fancy looking pose, which is actually fairly easy to do, so it's good on posters. In any case, what happened, this young man was uh, conceived by parents who were scholars. In fact, his grandfather was one of the greatest scholars in all of India. His father also very learned, especially in the sutras. So what his father did, well, what he did all the time was he chanted sutra, right? He recited sutra. Sutra means sacred words, put it that way. And one time as he was chanting t to his unborn child, his fetus, right, his baby in womb, as he was chanting, here's how the story goes, the young boy to be corrected him. Now, the way I heard it actually, and what makes sense to me is he shifted, maybe even made some noise. I don't know how a fetus makes noise, but he did something which actually probably didn't mean hey dad, you said it wrong. However, his father thought that the fetus was correcting him. He got really mad, a little defensive, and cursed his unborn child. He cursed him. So the boy was born with deformities. And literally, Ashtavakra means eight deformities, roughly. Right? And so it's also the crooked pose it's known as, and eight joints of his were messed up. And so he was you know, out of shape and distorted in his spine and his shoulders. And that's how he was born. Nonetheless, he thrived physically and especially intellectually. And having absorbed the great wisdom from his father's chanting, and as it was his destiny, he became one of the most learned young men in all of India. One day, his father decided to make a trip to a nearby kingdom um, that was ruled by a king named Janaka, the mother, by the way, of um, Sita, who you may know from Sita and Ram. But we'll leave that story for another time. So he goes to Janaka's palace because there is a great, what we call it, like a gathering of all the smartest, wisest teachers and sages of all India there. So Janaka goes there, or not Janaka, um, Ashtavakra's father goes there to participate in this. He brings his young son, who's like 10 at the time, to just witness it. When he goes, the guard outside the palace actually says, no, no, you can't come in. But somehow his father convinces the guard. He lets him in. And so they're in there and they're having this great debate. And uh, King Janak is quite a wise king. And he, you know, he's one of those wise men who knows that he doesn't know everything. So he invites people that know more to contribute and share. And so he's kind of like facilitating this great spiritual debate and it's going on, and this one's saying that, and this one's saying that, and this one's reciting this, and then 
it got juicy. Because then, 10-year-old Ashtavakra, out of nowhere, stands up, says to the king, don't listen to them. A hush fell over the crowd. One, he's not supposed to be there. Two, definitely not supposed to speak out. Three, he just insulted the wisest people in all of India, the wisest men, I should say, in that tradition at the time. So, but nonetheless, and his father is like, ah, what are you doing? You know, nonetheless, the king says, why? So, where Ashtavakra got that strength and power and clarity in that moment, we don't know. He says, because they don't know what they're talking about. It's all book learning. It's not experiential learning. He didn't use those words, but that's what he meant. So, the king, open-minded yet also a little bit skeptical, says, well, how do I know that you know anything? So the young boy says, well, I'll show you. Meet me tomorrow, and he gives them a location beside a river, and I will prove it to you. So the king, open-minded, says, all right. Big controversy, a lot of people upset. Nonetheless, what to do? His father takes him there, and the king shows up. The boy was already there with his father when the king showed up. And the king shows up, you know, riding by horseback with his royal guard and all of that. And just when he arrives, he finds the boy, sees him over there, rides up on his horse and stops. The boy is standing on the ground. The king goes to step off his horse and he's got one foot up. Well, you can't see that, but he's got one foot up, one foot still in the stirrup. And just in that moment, the boy, again, where did this come from? He says, stop, freeze. And he said it with such clarity, with such conviction, that literally the king, right, most powerful man for long ways around, stops his movement and freezes. And he stayed that way for some time. Until he woke up. He had a moment of enlightened Satori. And his life was changed forever. He knew that what the boy had said was true, that, yeah, books are good. Learning from books is good, though, unless we apply it and put it into our experience, unless we experience it ourselves, it's just theory. It's theoretical learning, right? So any actual learning, any real learning, only works in experience. So as I often say to clients and students, don't believe anything I say. I'm making it all up. As my friend Caroline Casey, great astrologer and author says, believe nothing, entertain possibilities. So you, my friend, my invitation to you is whatever the lesson is, whatever is taught, whatever you get from books or teachers, take it as a possibility, take it as a theory, take it as a hypothesis and say, I don't know if it's true, I'm going to act as if it is true, I'm going to try it on, I'm going to have the experience of it, and then I will know if it lands for me, if it's useful to me, awesome. If not, discard it. So, this is a story that was omitted from the book, actually my book, The Art of Spiritual Leadership. It was getting too big. Here it is though, a little peek behind the scenes, part of what inspired me for that story. I hope it's fun for you. I hope it's useful. I hope you remember it and can apply it. And I would love to hear from you in the comments. What do you think? What kind of learning works best for you? What's an example of when you learned something then got it experientially and it was important to you? And if this resonates for you, you might enjoy the book. I'll put a link down below and you can pick up a copy if you like. All right, y'all, thank you so much for tuning in. The Art of Spiritual Leadership. I hope you live vibrantly and continue to share with the world from the vibrancy that you are. Aloha.